thanks, Oleg, for, for the introduction. You've given the first 10 slides of my talk already. So uh, uh, the, uh, but it's, it's, uh, it's great to, to be speaking to uh, this group. Um, really, um, really, really is nice to see a lot of young people you know who are you know coming into the you know coming into the subject and uh, um, you know once upon a time and it doesn't seem that long ago I was one of the young people and now I'm a year away from retirement it seems a bit surreal but uh, yeah so um, my task is to give you a talk about meerkat um, and progressing the slide seems to be a challenge right um, and. The it's going to be a little bit historical in some ways, but quite technical as well. Talking about the actual technologies that go into um, into a radio telescope and Meerkat in particular. And as, as Oleg said, no, Meerkat is a real radio telescope. It was just a notion twenty years ago. It is now a real telescope, and it must be real because it's been on National Geographic, um, uh, the, the front cover. So, um, and interestingly, in the context of the, this meeting, uh, the article in the National Geographic was about SETI. Um, it wasn't actually about Meerkat necessarily. So as Oleg said, Meerkat has been a, an incredibly successful telescope. It's, it's only been operating for a few years. And as of last night, there were 198 papers um, you know, that have been published. And um, this is the only result I'm going to show because you know, once you've shown this one, no, nothing else really, really holds up. Um, so this is the map of the, the center of the, uh, of the, the Milky Way, our galaxy. That was made um, with with Meerkat and really is just you know a fantastic image, and um, and just to echo what, what what Oleg said, the telescope is not just the physical telescope; it's also the 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 whole data pipeline that goes through to produce this image, and a lot of the the software techniques that have been uh, developed within RAT have been used to to, to create this image, and in fact, obviously uh, the people behind it as well. As Oleg said, we just won a prize, the Royal Society Prize, uh, Royal Astronomy Society Prize, um, uh, a group prize. And uh, this is a group prize, and it's not a, a just the, the, the South African aspect of, of Meerkat. This is, um, if you, there's, there's a list of about 20 institutions that are uh, associated with this group, and it's universities within South Africa, universities and observatories around the world who have con contributed to Meerkat and have used Meerkat to very good effect. And that's why no, this was a group prize. So it was really good to get that. If you look at previous prize winners for this, no, LIGO um, was one of the, the group prize winners. So it's really a nice, uh, a, a nice accolade. Again, as Oleg said, radio astronomy in South Africa started at Rhodes. Um, and uh, for those of you who are interested, uh, I can tell you where you can find where the first radio telescope in Africa was located. And here it is here. Um, it's a, a solar radio telescope. <clears throat> a couple of um, uh, helical antennas here and some Yagi antennas over there on top of a hut. And um, yeah, th that was that was in the late 50s, uh, early 60s is when that was uh, uh, set up. And then it moved down the valley um, to get away from RFI. Um, and then when I was a student, this little dish used to stand outside the department. Um, little two meter dish that was going to be looking at uh, water vapor uh, mazes. Um, so yeah, it's uh, uh, another just anecdote. One of the people who was working on this telescope in the, in the late fifties, early sixties was a guy called Gerrit Fiskeur. Um And uh, Gerrit, after he finished his masters on this telescope, went to the PhD at Jodrell Bank, went across to the USA, spent a lot of time uh, in Puerto Rico at, uh, um, at Arecibo, recently kind of retired with his wife. And the, he, I saw him on a, a video just the other day. He was giving a, um, a press release at the, the, the um, what they call it, the um, Astronomy, American Astronomy Society, AAS meeting that's just been had in Seattle. And so he still actually you know, is, is active as a radio astronomer still, as an old Rhodian. Just pushing the Rhodes theme a little bit further, uh, when South Africa got involved in the SKA project early on, this is even pre, pre Meerkat. Um, I had to gather together a group of people who could um, help in both the site bid to you know, attract uh, SK to South Africa, but also to start doing some technical work to get involved in the SK on the technical side. And all of the people here, this was the team that we started off with. 
and all of the people here have a Rhodes Association. The most dubious one is, is uh, George Nicholson in the middle. He did his, uh, his degree at WITS, but he got an honorary degree from Rhodes for his work in pioneering radio astronomy at Hartebeer's Hook. But everybody else there is um, a, 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 well, a Rhodes product. You might uh, see, no, Adrian Tiplady there is still uh, no, very much involved with, with us, but a whole bunch of other people who contributed a lot to what we were going on. So um, just, you know, uh, the, in the context of the SKA and, and, and Meerkat, we needed to find a site. And initially it was a site for the, for the SKA, but then it became the site for, for, for Meerkat. And, you know, radio telescopes need to have, they've got some kind of specialist requirements. They're not like optical telescopes. Uh, you don't have to have dark skies necessarily, but the, the equivalent for us is radio, no, radio quietness. So you want a place where there's not a lot of radio transmissions. You want the weather to be good for, you know, for reasons like you don't want high winds, you don't want too much rain. You want it to be fairly flat. You want it to be tech, uh, geotechnically stable. You don't want your telescopes to fall over. But you also need to get, you know, be practical and you have to be able to get to this thing and you have to get power to it as well. So we did a site selection based on uh, on desktop studies to say, okay, there are these places in South Africa that might be good. But the key thing was radio you know, quietness. Um, and it, it, it's a bit of a misnomer really because there's nowhere really on earth anymore that's radio quiet because of satellites and aircraft and all of these things. But this is just an indication. This is really you know, the, the, the real hellhole of radio astronomy where Meerkat does most of its science in the so-called L band. And this is a, the, the frequency band here is from 900 to 1700, mega, uh, you know, 1700 megahertz. So you know, round about a gigahertz. And this is where a lot of really good science happens because you know, one of the, 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 uh, the things we do in radio astronomy is look for hydrogen. And the hydrogen line is right there, 1420 megahertz. And so that little blip there is the only astronomy signal in this plot. And that's our own galaxy, the brightest source in, you know, in the hydrogen sky. And that just makes the tiniest little blip like that. Whereas at all the, the other frequencies, we see really, really, really strong RFI signals. This is a log plot, so you know, in decibels. So on the left-hand side over there, around about 900 and something megahertz, cell phones. Um, and then um, aircraft, all the aircraft stuff over there, avionics, it's radars, uh, 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 DME, all those sorts of things, that's not gonna go away. Then GPS, GNSS satellites, takes up a whole lot of the spectrum. And then there's a nice little bit in the middle where we can do some astronomy. And then we go back into the satellite band again. So you know, radio, the RFI is a real, real problem in radio astronomy, even if you go to an RFI quiet site. And this data was taken um, you know, on, uh, from the, the, the Meerkat site. But still, you, know, uh, you, you do the best you can. And so you know, what's a proxy for RFI or terrestrial RFI? It's people because RFI follows people around and vice versa. Cell phones, TV, all those sorts of things. Northern Cape province of South Africa is 40% of the land mass, 4% of the population. So this is a plot of population density. There's an obvious kind of low density population area over there. And so that was a good place to go looking. And uh, so that's what we did. And I spent a lot of time in about 2003 or so driving around the Northern Cape in places where most people have never been before um, and these places became quite well known to me. You get off the beaten track, Williston, Clayton Pardacliffe, those sorts of places. And you go, and how do you find out whether the place is radio quiet or not? Is you go and you detect radio signals. You have an aerial um, and a, a spectrum analyzer, and you go park out in the bush with the best 4x4x4, four by four by four, which is a Avis car, um, and, a, and a, of course a combi. We did this uh, these early this early work together with ICASA, you know, the South African Radio um, uh, Regulator, and went to measure whether this place was really radio quiet. And out we went, and uh, poor Andy Uted, who's technician at Rhodes University, took my job actually. Um, he um, uh, he was doing his masters at the time, and I'd say to Andy, "What are you doing on the weekend?" And before he could answer, I said, "Pack your bags, you're coming with me." And we went out and set up a, a camp in the bush and did measurements. Um, and you can see it's quite uh, arduous sometimes. And uh, yeah, one of us slept a lot. Uh, this was actually my birthday in 2003 that uh, we were out in the bush. I had to deal with other things other than RFI. And eventually we, we came upon, a, we decided on a site. We had three candidate sites. 
but we went for what we called the Kalahari site, uh, the um, the Karoo site. There was a Kalahari and a Makwa site as well. And Bernie Fanroff was the project director at that stage. And I said to Bernie, let's build it over there. And, uh, and that's pretty much where Meerkat is today and where the SKA is going to be. So what, why is it a, a good site? Well, it's, it's in the middle of nowhere. So you know, it's intrinsically fairly radio quiet. But um, it's in a, and it's in a nice flat plain because that's where all the, the, the uh, there's a, a lot of alluvium there that used to be a sea back in the day. Then Africa rose up and the sea drained away and left this nice flat plain. And these nice flat topped hills, particularly towards the south of the, of the site, which are really good at blocking radio waves coming from the ground. So the N1 with all its cell phone towers and Cape Town and Port Elizabeth and everything else are all out though to the south. And these nice flat topped hills uh, stop the, the radio waves from coming over. They stop diff the, the, the diffraction even. So just to remind us where that is again, is Cape Town down at the bottom um, and you know, Kanda over here. But uh, there it is over there. And that, that uh, remember what we were doing is we were actually at this stage finding a site for the SKA, not necessarily for Meerkat. And um, <clears throat> the SKA was going to expand over the entire African continent, including some of the East Islands as well. Um, but no, the, 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 um, the SKA phase one is, a, is a, a, a quite a re reduced uh, version of the full the vision of the SKA, about 10%, and also not as extensive. So that triangle there shows the extent that the, the SKA will uh, uh, go out to with its three spiral arms. And Meerkat is sort of stuck in the middle there where those yellow pins are. So you know, it is a fairly remote spot. If you zoom in a bit more, you can see where uh, you know, SKA will extend out. You can't even see Meerkat just yet, really, because it's still you know, embedded in those, those yellow dots in the middle. But here's the town of Carnarvon, and there's Williston over there. So those are the two closest uh, sorts of towns, and Bruntflay is up on the left over there. Um, the red lines that you can see in there are all the farms that have been bought up um, for the central area of the SKA and Meerkat. So we're, you know, the, the, uh, the, the SKA antennas will extend beyond that area. We'll effectively rent space from farmers uh, beyond that. But in the middle, we really do want complete control over that area uh, because the antennas are quite densely situated there. And um, you want to you know, protect things against RFI. That's 130,000 hectares of land. That's a big, big chunk of land. And you know, we're, we're astronomers and technicians and engineers. We know nothing about land management. So we've actually got this really nice arrangement with the, uh, the National Parks Board um, in that it is actually become a national park. It's the Meerkat National Park. Uh, it's not for, for tourism, but it will be uh, used for, for um, you know, conservation uh, um, uh, purposes. So it's going to be stocked with animals and all those things. But, and it's going to be one of the biggest national parks in the country. Or well, it is one of the biggest national parks in the country. So that was quite a nice thing. And so there'll be a lot of biological research going on there as well as astronomy. But you know, um, this is now all be the, the, these pictures come from where before we actually um, won the site bid. Um, but one of the things was that we chose an area which is in the middle of nowhere um, because we wanted to be RFI quiet and all of those things. But we still did need to be able to get there. We still did need power. And we still did need data. So <clears throat> there was a big infrastructure build program that had to go on to get power in. There was no Eskom power in that area. Uh, we needed to upgrade the roads so that we could get in there easily. And we had to get data out. on. Uh, so we had to put a fiber in so that we could uh, establish that. And Tracy Cheatham was our uh, infrastructure manager back then, did a fantastic job of getting this all in. And then on the site itself, you needed stuff as well. I mean, it was a, it was a sheep farm before. Um, <clears throat> we needed some, some stuff there. We needed some buildings. Uh, which we'll come back to later, and we used to, had to dig holes in the ground, and so big yellow machines had to come in and uh, disturb what was before pristine site. One thing that um, radio telescopes need is power. They chew power. They really do, and of course that's kind of unfortunate in uh, this, this day and age with Eskom's woes, but we need a lot of power. Uh, a lot of it goes into the antennas themselves. We have to you know, drive the antennas. We have cryogenic fridges. Um, refrigerators which use power but one of the bigger users of power is compute our, our computers use a lot of power so there's a lot of big copper that goes in we had to upgrade the the um, power supply to the area the Eskom power supply to the area we had to upgrade their substations because they weren't going to do enough juice 
So th that was all setting up the site. It was part of the site bit and everything else. In parallel, there was a thought that we should build a telescope as well, our own, not just sit around and wait for the SKA. Initially, that was so that we could um, compete in getting contracts to build the SKA. And so we were involved. It, we, we started thinking about looking at SKA technologies. There were a lot of ideas going around at the time internationally. I was going to a lot of meetings where people were saying, oh, this is the way we're going to build the SKA. I'd bring those ideas back. And we'd sort of think about it and we'd say, OK, we're going to build this Pathfinder instrument with these high risk options, the, high, the, the really, really cool technology that these things looked like they were going to be really, really good. And uh, we started designing things on on strip uh, on, on the flip charts, as one did back in those days. And uh, you can see there's a correlator and there's a station beam former and a pulsar search engine even over here and pulsar timer. So we were on the right track to, to where we were going. And what, what, what I was doing was I was basically giving road shows to engineers around the country to say, guys, we need engineers to work in radio astronomy. And, you know, it was designed by PowerPoint. You know, these were my first ideas about what the dishes would look like. You can see really detail in there, but you can see 15 meter diameter, F over D even. And then um, the ideas, uh, well, and, and right early on, there was the understanding that compute was going to be an important thing, both in terms of the design of the equipment, but and then also doing the data processing afterwards. But the idea floating around back then is in order to build a square kilometer array of you know, collecting area, you'd have to have cheap dishes. So everybody was looking at really, really cheap dishes, and then you would fix all the problems with the dishes in software afterwards. That was the idea going around that. And we, we pursued that idea. I drank that water. And um, focal plane arrays were the thing to go for, phased arrays very high risk at the time because people were doing a lot of work on it, but not having a lot of success. Um, but, um, you know, uh, that was where we started. And some more detailed design work um, uh, of what the thing would look like. And I wanted to have railway lines like the VLA, but I was told I couldn't earlier on. And then uh, we got a bit more sophisticated and we got some graphic artists involved. And, um, you know, that was what uh, the Karoo Array Telescope was going to look like. And the Karoo Array Telescope was morphing into something with something like 20 antennas um, um, on the site in, no, in the Karoo. And you can see that the graphic artist knew nothing about radio astronomers because those people are not wearing what radio astronomers wear. If you look around the, the room here, yeah, you will see that's not what we wear. Um, then things got a bit more serious. We actually got some real engineers in and we started looking at these uh, SKA technologies. Looked at the, uh, uh, we had a, what we called the XDM, the experimental uh, uh, data, uh, sorry, exper 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 XDM was experimental, but not DM, can't remember, but the X was experimental. And um, we built a, a 15 meter one piece um, uh, fiberglass dish, um, biggest dish that ever been made that size uh, for, for radio astronomy, because this was seen as a cheap way of making dishes, popping them off of a mold. And that was at Hartbeer Sick, we did that. So we, uh, I in particular had drunk very deeply of the water of the, the, the phased array feed. And so we built a phased array feed and we tested test range in Pretoria. Um, the whole idea of the phased array feed was you get a very wide field of view. It's like a radio camera. And there were some big names in astronomy in, in the world who were pushing that very strongly. And those of you who know ASCAP, the Australian telescope, ASCAP has phased array feeds um, on it. Um, we built this, the, the, the um, the, the the big dish uh, at Hartbeer Sook, the XDM, and there it is standing next to the 26 meter at Hartbeer Sook. And it is actually, you know, it, it was very good. It taught us a whole lot of stuff about how to build dishes out of carbon, uh, out of uh, fiberglass. Um, it taught us that phased array feeds were not the way to go. And it's actually been repurposed today um, as a VLBI telescope at Hartbeer Sook. So it's actually, you know, it's, it's still doing a good job. We went a step further and we actually then built an array telescope, more than just one dish, seven dishes, CAT7. Um, you can see they're 12 meter dishes. The previous dish was 15 meters. One of the things we'd learned is 15 meters is a bit big uh, to build as a one piece dish. These were 12 meter dishes and we changed a few other things as well. And we, But we still did, you know, uh, used a fiberglass to make a, a molded dish. And we learned a little bit more about how to build these or not to build these things. So that was, you know, CAT7 taught us a lot. And CAT7 did some science, though there were quite a lot of papers that came out of CAT7. But very importantly, what it did is it really uh, taught our engineers 
an awful lot of work. Now, engineers didn't come from radio astronomy backgrounds. They were largely from military and radar backgrounds. Um, and we had a very, very small radio astronomy community in South Africa, and it allowed our radio astronomy community, well, to us to grow a radio astronomy community, and particularly around uh, arrays. And then through processes which I still don't fully understand, more money became available. And so we weren't anymore looking at cat, we were looking at meerkat. So those who know Afrikaans, meer means more, more cat. And of course, it just happens to be the same little no, animal that runs around the, you know, in the Karoo. And there was what I call the meerkat challenge. You know, the government basically said to us, OK, this is still before the site bid was decided. Build the world's best telescope until the SKA comes along. For a fixed cost, we were told this is how much money you got. You've got to build it within this time scale. Um, and it basically, it was, it was a mitigation for the site decision. If the Australians had won the site outright, then we would slave a telescope in South Africa. And it would very definitely had to be a precursor for the SKA. In other words, the, techno the, the technologies, the, the science and, uh, needed to be you know, what the SKA was chasing and had to do training for people. <clears throat> One of the first things we did, we said, OK, if we build this telescope, what science do people want to do? So we put out a, a request for proposals for the whole world to say, if we build this thing, what science would you do? And we came up, with it, and then these international groups came up with the legacy science surveys for Meerkat. And then that gave us something to, to design around. So that said, okay, we can now do some detailed design. We won't go into the details of these things, but basically, not surprisingly, it's the SKA science case. We then used this concept called systems engineering to take those user requirements, <clears throat> that, that science program, put it into user requirements, and then converted that into a design. And this is one of the things that because a lot of our engineers came from um, aerospace backgrounds, uh, military backgrounds, systems engineering is very, used very strongly there. Not so much in radio astronomy, where basically university groups get together and piece the things together on their, on, their, no, on their lab benches. So this is a very much more formal process going through user requirements. You look through all of the concepts. You do a lot of prototyping. You work to baselines. You don't keep changing your mind, which is what I used to do a lot. Uh, you, you define uh, interfaces between all the different subsystems. Um, and very importantly, you do life, no, life cycle analysis. Now, how is this thing going to be built? How is this thing going to operate? And how, in, in the end, how are we going to decommission it? And you, very, very importantly, you have reviews. You have um, you start off with concept design reviews, uh, preliminary design reviews, detailed design reviews, critical design reviews. Uh, pre-construction reviews and you bring in the best people you can to um, to review and this is one of our review teams back in in the day and you know really top experts in the world um, some of them now actually rat people um, and because you want to be told what you're doing wrong because you're going to spend a lot of money and you don't want to spend it badly and you don't want to hold on to your your, your sort of favorite ideas when they might be bad and in, in the, 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 this, the, this concept design phase, um, you have to take into account a lot of different uh, parameters. Um, metrics on the, the sort of uh, uh, performance metrics, which are sort of written on the left-hand side over there, and then cost functions on the right. So you want to build the best telescope. So all of the things on the left, sensitivity, field of view, resolution, dynamic range, stability, or all those sorts of things, <clears throat> you want those to be as good as you can get, but these things hold you back. How much is it going to cost? How much power is it going to use? So you do a, um, your concept exploration takes you through this parameter space and you do a, a, I wouldn't call it an optimization, but you, you, you find your way around. And there's all sorts of equations that you work with, the cost of antennas. And there's a model for the cost of antennas is that the, the cost of an antenna goes as roughly diameter to the 2.7 and frequency to the, the, to the 0.3. So the higher frequency you want to go to, the more it's going to cost. The bigger the diameter, the more it's going to cost, obviously. But interestingly, it's to the 2.7. Now, area goes as a, a, a diameter squared. So what it says to you is if you want to build a big collecting area, you don't want to build one big dish. You actually want to build a lot of small dishes. So if the only cost constraint that you had was the dish, you would build tiny little dishes. <clears throat> but what um, mitigates against that is when you have lots of dishes, you need lots of electronics. And so the electronics cost goes up. And so you get a, you know, a, a, a V-shaped curve. And so, yeah, that was one of the things we went to. And, and it turns out that dishes between 12 and 15 meters are perhaps what you want. There are lots of cases in, in the world, and particularly in, in, in radio astronomy, where people got this wrong. 
uh, they well got their, their dish costing wrong very famously. Uh, Sir Bernard Lovell got it very very wrong for the, the Mark One, uh, the iconic Mark One dish at Jodrell Bank. He this is no, remembering this is back in you know 1960 was 700 thousand pounds over over budget, nearly went to jail, and he was saved by Sputnik because he could detect Sputnik, and so he got out of jail. Um, other important metrics now, looking on the performance side, one of the things is how sensitive is the telescope. TSIS is a, a, a measure of how much noise your telescope makes, and you want that to be as low as possible. And the effective aperture is the, how effectively how big is your antenna. And it turns out with TSIS, there's no, a whole lot of TSIS you can do nothing about because it's because it's the you know, the galaxy, the cosmic microwave background, uh, the fact that the, the, the sun's up in the sky. You can't turn them off. The only thing you can do is make your receiver better and make your antenna better. And um, and you want the effective aperture to be as big as possible because in the end, the sensitivity um, parameter is the effective uh, aperture divided by the system temperature. So you want effective aperture to be as big as possible, system temperature to be as low as possible because when you go through the equations and radiometry equation in particular, you find the length of time that it takes you to observe what you want to do is the square of A over T, or inverse square of A over T. So though, if you want to observe something within your lifetime, you want A over T to be as big as possible. So that's what you take into account in your engineering. Now, this is a slide you'll see much better versions of, I'm sure, during this week. But just a quick introduction to what we do with radio interferometry. What you want to do on, at the top left there is the image of the sky that you eventually want. So you've got a radio galaxy, in this case, up on the sky. And you observe it with a whole lot of dishes on the ground that all point at that source. And the way that these dishes work is that they um, they basically uh, 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 it's a, it's a it's a diffraction process, and the beam on the sky is the Fourier transform effectively of what's called the aperture function. So the, the, the you, what you're doing is you are observing your the, the sky with your dishes, and the Fraunhofer diffraction equation is the one that um, is what you want. Then what we do is we correlate all of the signals between all of these dishes. And so every pair of dishes you correlate and the um, and you and you calculate visibilities. And it's that simple integral that you see at the bottom there. You take the the the, um, the signals from two different dishes, you overlay them and you multiply and integrate. And that's what we call correlation. So you need a correlator. And then it turns out because of the Van Zernike theorem, is that there's a Fourier transform relationship between the what you see um, in the visibilities and to get back to the sky here. So to do this whole thing here, you need a lot of compute and you need a lot of telescope. So that, I'll come back to this picture a bit later. Out of that, now this is Oleg is obviously the no, the expert in this. One of the metrics that we want to get right is dynamic range, and so from the, from what I've shown back over here, what we measure is the visibilities down at the bottom, but what we want is the image at the top. And unfortunately, <clears throat> um, no, Oleg and, and others said, well, there's this thing called the measurement equation. So these Vs that you see here, those are the visibilities. That's what we measure from the correlator. The S and the, and the X, these are the two of the same equations, I'm told. They're just written in different formalisms. But S over here is the sky. X over there is the sky. And so what we measure is V, which is, no, being processed by these equations. The trouble is you need to now invert these equations to get back to S and X. And that's what Oleg and Co are going to tell you a lot about this this uh, um, uh, this week. So you, in order to do, to do that, you need to make sure that you've built a telescope where this very, very ill-formed set of equations can be inverted. And you don't want to, compute, no, to confound matters even more by making the telescope contribute more nonsense to these equations that there's already there. And so that's what we call, you know, in order to get good dynamic range, you need to build a telescope with good Jones matrices. It must behave well. And one of the ways to do that is to get your optics right for the dishes. Now, I said that the, the beam on the sky for each of these dishes is the, is the Fraunhofer diffraction pattern of the, the aperture function, big words. CAT7 used a very, very simple dish geometry which was just a parabola and with the receiver stuck in the middle. And so the, the, the radiation comes down and gets focused on that receiver. Uh, and that's nice and simple and everything else. But the thing is the receiver is then sitting in the middle of the aperture. 
and that receiver needs to be held with struts and all of that stuff gets in the way of the aperture. And what that does is it really messes with the beam. It causes all sorts of horrible side lobes. So what you wanna do is you wanna get your, all that stuff away. And the way you do that is to go for these offset designs. And, um, and in fact, the sort of the extreme of that is to go for what's called the offset Gregorian. This over here is still a parabola. This over here is an ellipse. And you have a, 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 um, a dual reflector system with two foci, and you put your receiver over here. And now you see that your radio waves coming in from your sources don't collide with all of the receiver stuff, and they get pulled off to the side and get received on the side. So that's what CAT7 used, the, 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 the simple design, and Meerkat used the more complex design. This is one my early, again, designed by PowerPoint slides. We're still with a 15-meter dish there to show how this might work. And th this is what happens. If you look at the beam so, um, of, of a, a CAT7 dish, you can see that the, the, the thing that you want is that main beam in the middle. Then there's all this other rubbish on the side, the, all these side lobes. You don't want those side lobes. For one thing, they pick up uh, uh, RFI from satellites. Whereas if you have a Meerkat dish, then all of the energy is in the main beam. And the side lobes over here are very, very much no, no, sort of um, uh, no, lower down. And that makes things a lot easier and theoretically makes it much easier to get to high dynamic range images. So anyway, we, we, we had to go through a lot of these kind of decision trees to say, what are we gonna build for Meerkat? And so you'd say, okay, what sort of receptor options do we want? We, right at the top, you say, well, center fed a, a, a dish like you know, Cat7, or are we gonna go a new route of the Gregorian offset? And then what kind of receiver are we going to uh, um, uh, put on that? And then, what kind of uh, cooling system are we going to use to cool those receivers down? And what you do is you go through all of these options and you cost them, you look at their performance, you look at their cost, and you look at the bang for buck. And it turned out that when we went through that exercise, even though this was the most expensive option to go for the Gregorian offset um, uh, um, uh, optics, go for fairly narrow band receivers rather than the very wide band receivers that the rest of the world were chasing after, and you use traditional uh, uh, helium cooling systems, which take your receiver down to very low temperatures. This was by far the most expensive option, but normalized performance was actually a factor of two better but in terms of bang per buck than any of the other options. And so by doing this very rational way of designing Meerkat, where you know, emotional things like this is a really cool technology, but does it really work well for us? Um, you know, we managed to sort of shed that, and in particular in my case, because I really like chasing after the cool technologies, and we built this thing. So even though it was more cost, the unblocked aperture gave us a good beam, a very high aperture efficiency, that means our A over T was good. There was no spill, no, there was no spill over onto the ground. The ground radiates radio waves. You don't want those to get into your receiver. This optics ensures that. And, and then very practical things, like if you want to get to the receiver, there it is. You can just climb up onto the structure and get there. With the other designs, you need a cherry picker to get up there. And so in terms of life cycle costing, so this was the obvious, even though this looks terrible, it looks you know, from a mechanical engineering point of view, a bit of a nightmare, it was the way to go. The other thing about system engineering is that you design and then you test afterwards. And this is probably something you'll be looking at again now is to say uh, we used um, in the design process, uh, we used uh, electromagnetic uh, simulation packages to say, this is what the beams are gonna look like. When we built the thing, we did holography to say, okay, this is what the beams actually look like. Do they compare? Was our design correct? And there's a lot of work being going on about this and Ben knows a bit about this. Now, the interesting thing was that we built CAT7 as a prototype for Meerkat, but it wasn't at all because what CAT7 taught us was what not to do. And so a whole lot of the stuff in red there, we'd binned because CAT7 had taught us that was not the way to go. A couple of things made their way through to, 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 to a Meerkat. But the important thing was that the, our engineers learned a lot, and so they carried on through. So we made, I wouldn't say mistakes, but we, we learned some hard lessons on seven antennas, and then we built a good 64 antennas. So no, we came up with the detailed design for, for, for Meerkat. Gregorian offset, cooled octave feeds, um, a fairly compact array configuration, digitize the signal very directly at the receiver, use an FX correlator, and you know, use the best calibration. Long story short, we built Meerkat. This is the 64 antennas. This is the inner core of Meerkat. This is why the images that come out of Meerkat are really cool, because they, the antennas are very closely spaced, and so you get to see all the big fluffy 
uh, emission from the radio sources. So coming back to this picture again, because all, all I want to do now is to say, okay, what do we need to build? Well, we need to build antennas, <clears throat> need to build a correlator, and we need to build a, a an inverse machine that's going to do an inverse FFT and much more. Um, so what we do, we then build a Meerkat architecture. So this is a gen generic architecture for radio uh, telescopes. So on the left-hand side there, you have the what I call the antennas or receptors. And there's 64 of those in the case of Meerkat. Um, on each of those antennas, we have up to four receivers. Meerkat has three receivers, but a space for a fourth. Um, so you have those receivers. Each of them co covers around about um, a factor of two in bandwidth, uh, in frequency. Um, we immediately then digitize that signal. You can see digitizers are stuck behind. So take the analog signal, we live in a digital world, convert it immediately to a digital signal, put it onto, our, uh, onto a fiber optics and bring it into a central processor. Then we've got to do the correlation or beam forming. So we then need a, a, a compute uh, machine over here, which does the, um, the multiply and accumulates effectively, which you know, are, are the correlation. Then the output of that goes to the science data processor because then you have to do the inverse um, um, imaging process to take the visibilities, which come out over here. So this is a big pipe of visibilities, goes into the science data processor. And then on the sidelines, what you need is a, a time and frequency reference system. Time and frequency are very, very important to radio astronomy. We need to keep our frequency. We need to know what our frequencies are. And for, uh, for pulsars, we need to know very precisely what the time is. So you stick those on the side. There's a lot of what people would consider boring things of going to radio telescopes. The, radio, the dishes have to be fixed to the ground. They mustn't move because if they do move, then your beam moves in the sky and that's going to uh, reduce your dynamic range. A lot of design work goes into, um, into foundations. And to show how important foundations are, Tony Beasley over there um, is the director of National Radio Astronomy Observatory in, you know, in the USA. Phil Diamond is the director general of the SKA. They're interested in foundations, and so no, it must be important. But you can see a lot of rebar and lots of concrete goes in. Again, system engineering, having built the foundation, is it as stiff as we thought it was? And you do a physics first year experiment. You tie, you stick a post into the ground and you put in a cable, hydraulic jack, and you pull to see if that dish does in fact move, or if that, that foundation does move, and it does. And you, more importantly, does it go back to where it was when you left it behind? So, you know, Hooke's Law applies. If Hooke's Law applies, then you've built uh, a good foundation. A lot of fun. But then you go into actually building this thing. You've, you know, you've got the design. And just to emphasize that this thing was built in South Africa. These are the pedestals for the dishes uh, built in, 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 in uh, uh, Kempton Park in Johannesburg. Uh, you can see the, the backup structure for the dish being welded up on the left-hand side there, also in Johannesburg and also in the West Coast. And then assembled on site, like a big Meccano set. The uh, reflector panels for the dish. Now you can see these are aluminium panels. We're not building fiberglass dishes anymore. Cat7 taught us fiberglass dishes, very nice concept, very hard to do. Uh, traditional aluminium dishes are the way to go. Again, built in Johannesburg. But we, the, 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 the subreflector um, is small enough to do in carbon fiber. And so that was cast also in Johannesburg. So yeah, you put the dish together in the shed that we've built on site, you put it onto a trailer, you drag it off onto the site. Um, the pedestal has come from Johannesburg, already built, uh, gets plonked onto the foundation, it's already built, and then you get the big yellow crane, put the dish on, and there, do that 64 times, and that's how you have uh, your cat. So that's the, the first part of the, of, the, of the architecture. Then you've got the receivers, and the receivers then obviously sit in the, 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 fo the focus of the antenna, um, the, the receivers sit on a, on a rotating platform, so you can have four of them, and you rotate the one that you want into the focus. Here's one of the receivers over here with the sun shield on it. And um, we, as I said, we, we immediately, uh, so the, the, these receivers are all cryogenically cooled to about 17 Kelvin. Uh, so that means that they have to be inside a vacuum flask. So that's the inside of the receiver over there, and then that's all enclosed within a vacuum with a cold head which pulls the temperatures down to 17 Kelvin. So the receivers will be sitting over here on this turntable. Uh, these are the digitizers. So this box here and that box there are the digitizers for two of the receivers. And that's a vacuum pump in the middle to, um, to, to, to pull down the vacuum in the vacuum flask. And then there's fiber optics come out of that. So this is the internals of the receivers. We went for these fairly uh, conservative type of receivers with only a bandwidth of around about a factor of two. 
You can see they're cross dipoles. You get both polarizations from those dipoles. Then all of that gets stuck inside this. This it gets cooled down and stuck inside this. Um, uh, here's the, the. This is the the, the helium um, uh, refrigerator. It has a finger that comes through and cools down the receiver on this end over here, and then stuck the whole thing into the vacuum flask. This is how it all kind of gets built up. So a lot of technology is going in here, and then we go digital. So the first thing we do is the signals, while they're still analog, need to be conditioned a little bit. Those of you who know about sampling, we need to have a Nyquist uh, um, filter in there to Nyquist band limit the, the signal, goes into an analog to digital converter, and then goes through digital uh, down conversion, get the, the basically shift the, the signal uh, frequency band down to uh, um, a lower frequency where we can deal with it. We need to do a coarse delay because when we do the correlation, we've got to line the signals up. So you put in a coarse delay, we split the signal up into a whole lot of different frequencies uh, in, using a filter bank, polyphase filter bank, and then we apply a fine delay to get the signals to line up really properly, and we do that by apply, applying a, a phase slope. Those of you know Fourier transforms know that a, a signal time delay is a linear phase slope in the frequency domain. So that's what the correlator does. We call uh, well, that's the what we call the F engine that that converts the signal into its Fourier transform in order to get the different bands. Then you take you do that per antenna, then you take all of the antennas and you correlate them together in this box over here. Or you add them together to form a B, B engine, and then you stick it into your imaging software and you make images um, afterwards. So the digitizers, again, designed and built in South Africa. Um, they're 10-bit A to Ds, for those of you who know about these things. There's two polarizations per antenna, and we sample at 17, 12 megabits per second, mega samples per second in, in the L band. If you work out that data rate, it's a DVD per second per antenna. And if you had to record that data for the whole array, that would be a pile of DVDs 12 kilometers high per day. So you, no, th what this is saying is you cannot record this data. You have to deal with it in real time. And the, what you need to do is to do the correlation. Oh, th just, just to show here the effect of RFI, um, th this is the output of the, of the digitizer. Um, and when the when the digitizer is working nicely and everything's all good, basically what the, uh, this is a histogram of the samples coming out of the digitizer. So you've got vo this basically voltage samples, and when the telescope's working nicely, basically you're you're, you're detecting uh, noise, a nice Gaussian distribution of voltages. This is a log plot, so it's a parabola, and that's what you get. But as soon as you come near a satellite or an airplane flies overhead, then suddenly your signal gets messed up by RFI. All of this stuff over here is RFI. And you can see this is the, actually it, the, it exceeds the, the, the range of the, of the ADCs. And that's really not a nice place to be. So that's why you want to be in an RFI quiet environment. Equally, you don't want your own equipment to be generating RFI. So there is a, a digitizer sitting over there in the bottom left-hand side in our uh, anechoic chamber in, in, Cape, in Cape Town, where we test that our own equipment doesn't generate RFI that would blind us. We have to do very, very uh, intensive testing, looking for these tiny, tiny little signals to make sure that they go away. And this is, in fact, a whole mock-up of the antenna drive system uh, that was put into an anechoic chamber uh, to test that it wasn't going to blind us. So, But now we've got all this data, huge amounts of data, roughly uh, of the order of the internet traffic of the whole, of, no, of, the, whole, um, of, uh, of the world, coming into the, the, the correlator. And um, the correlator and the time and frequency reference system and the science data processor all sit in the Karoo, and they, but all of this electronics radiates radio emission. And you know, basically all the clocks on the, on, the, on the processor boards just radiate and they would blind us. So we've got to take all of the stuff, which is all stuck in these data racks, and put it inside a big tin box uh, and into a Faraday cage. And then we put that Faraday cage in the building, which is basically underground. So um, the, the data rack area sits underground in that bit of the building. And then all of the power conditioning stuff over here as well. And the we, reason we stick it underground is to give us even more RFI shielding and also because it's cooler underground in the Karoo than it is above ground. And the, just to give you a, a sort of a, a, an idea of how much power we need, now these are the transformers. These are big transformers. They would fill this room um, all underground in that building. Because even when Eskim's working reasonably, it's still not as, as good as we need it. We need 99.999% reliability of our power. 
So we have these diesel rotary PS units, which turn away um, when, the, when, the, when the power goes. We've got basically a, a small, well, quite a big substation. This, the, the, this whole electrical plant would power Grahamstown quite easily. Um, and then all of the electronics goes into this big tin box. And so the tin box is the outside over here. And then we've got the, these, these are the data racks inside over here with all the stuff. And over there is a little room which contains the time and frequency reference. We use mazes. We'll see the picture of that just now. Um, but you can see there's a lot of equipment you know, in, in here. And so just looking for, for what we want to look at now, this is CBF. This is the correlator sits so in these racks over here. And the science processor sits over there. So the data from the, the, the antennas comes into the correlator, gets correlated, and then goes to the science processor. A lot of the science processor is disk storage because they store um, the, um, you can't keep up in, in absolute real time with the, with the science processor. You can't do it anyway. You need to record the data and then uh, uh, process the recorded data. And I'll come back to a bit later, the green blocks, which is the, the user supplied equipment. With, uh, um, and then a whole lot of other stuff over here, you know, all the networking equipment and all of those things. And here are, um, sits in these racks too. So there's the big tin box. That's what it looks like when it was being built. These are all steel panels, which are bolted together to keep all of the radiation inside. But there's practical things. You need to get power in. So the power has to go into this building, into this tin box, has to go through these filters to make sure that the electrical power cables don't uh, let out uh, radiation. And very practical things like you need air conditioning. And how do you do air conditioning you know, with such a box? And so quite a lot of, uh, and you need these red pipes over here or fire, you know, fire, hydrant, uh, fire protection stuff. This is the, um, the, the, these are the mazes that we use for our time frequency reference. They're very, very precise clocks. <clears throat> and um, we have two of them so that we can check them against each other. Um, and then we compare them against GPS. And in particular, we use the GPS to do a time transfer to Paris to make sure that our time standard is the same as the universal time standard for the rest of the world, down to about a nanosecond accuracy. The correlator, which correlates these signals coming from the antennas at this massive, massive data rate. Can't just be any computer. It has to be a special purpose computer. We use these devices called field programmable gate arrays, FPGAs. So an FPGA is basically a chip that you program. Rather than writing scripts, which get go onto a, an Intel processor or whatever, what this, does, this chip does is you process the chip to have the uh, characteristics that you want. And basically, you know, a, a, a correlation is multiply, accumulate. You don't do FFTs. And so you, you build a chip, you can program the chip to be exactly what you want. You need lots of memory, so the HMC memory sits there, and you need a lot of data bandwidth. And so there's no 40 gig, well, in, in this version, 40 gig Ethernet ports to get the data in and out. We're moving up to 100 gigs now. And you need lots of them. There's about 200 and something of these uh, a scarab boards, so-called, again, designed in South Africa, which form the correlator. So the correlator sits there, pretty much one of the most powerful computers in the world. And then you take that and that goes into the science data processor. The science data processor is more compute, is more commodity compute, a mixture of GPUs and CPUs and a lot of disk space. And again, the, the, even the disk modules here were, were designed in South Africa and built in South Africa. Um, and um, yeah, but say commodity compute, but, but uh, a, a lot of clever thought as to how this commodity compute would be used. And so, the, the, and then it goes to Cape Town to go to the CHPC to be archived. Um, very important bit of, of Meerkat is the so-called user-supplied equipment. So we built Meerkat as a basic telescope, which would do imaging and a little bit of beam forming, maybe on a good day could do some pulsar timing. And perhaps even if somebody got really clever, do some transient searching. But the, uh, uh, our colleagues in the rest of the world said, no, well, look, we'd like to be involved in this. We're involved in this in the SK case anyway. So we're designing stuff for the SK. We've got stuff on existing telescopes. Let, can we bring this stuff along and plonk it on the back end of Meerkat? Now, we des one of the things we, we designed into Meerkat was that it had what I call data spigots because the, 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 the whole architecture of the machine really just sits on, 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 um, on a backbone of commodity network switches. As long as there's a network port on there, you can pull data out. You can pull the data out that you want. So as long as there's enough switch, you can go in and plug your stuff in. And so the, 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 these were the, um, the the people came along. Okay, HERO is completely separate. That's a different telescope. Uh, but very importantly, in the context of, of this meeting, BLUs, Breakthrough Listen. Um, there's a whole 
row of racks over there, which are doing SETI work, basically pulling Meerkat data out all of the time. Um, FBFBUs, it's a filter bank beam former, in order to search for uh, transients and pulsars, you need a lot of beams on the sky. And uh, Max Planck um, um, colleagues uh, no, uh, brought that. If you want to look for pulsars, you need to do uh, accelerated pulsar search. And again, Max Planck provided that. Um, if you want to detect transients, um, then you need what we call mere trap, which came from Manchester. And if you want part time pulsars, we have PTUs, which is pulsar timing, which is largely out of Swinburne. Um, these, uh, the, basically, these groups here are building the same stuff for the SKA. So a lot of that, though, just to give you an idea, again, this is just a lot of compute. Uh, these are largely um, GPU and CPU uh, commodity computers, and uh, they're bolted onto the back of Meerkat and doing some wonderful science. And then, of course, the, the, the breakthrough is in um, no stuff as well, uh, a whole row of racks of that. And then uh, what our Max Planck uh, colleagues did as well is, is provide us with S-band receivers. So that's the third receiver band on, on Meerkat 2. And so we have 64 of those. Um, going forward now, we'll be, be going into Meerkat extension. Meerkat will be bigger. And of course, after that, we'll be looking at the SKA as well. But hopefully that gives you some idea of how Meerkat came about and the bits and pieces that go into it. Thanks.